Good afternoon. I'm Victoria Marshall with the latest news from the Washington Watch News Desk. President Joe Biden has authorized the use of anti-personnel mines to Ukraine for the first time, a defense official confirmed Wednesday. More than two years ago, the Biden administration pledged to limit the use of anti-personnel mines around the world due to their disproportionate impact on civilians. Now, this reversal is the Biden administration's second policy flip in several days as the outgoing White House seeks to shore up Ukraine's defenses against Russia before President-elect Trump takes office and likely reduces U.S. support of Ukraine. On Sunday, the U.S. also authorized Ukraine to use U.S.-provided long-range missiles to strike targets inside Russia. Ukrainian forces fired the missiles into Russia yesterday. On Wednesday, they fired British-made storm shadow missiles into Russian territory as well. Now, the story comes as the U.S. closed its embassy in Kyiv, citing threats of a potential significant air attack from Russia. Now, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley has warned that Biden's decisions risk a full-scale war with Russia. Well, it looks like escalation to me, Laura. It looks like a, a, a green light for escalation on the part of Ukraine and then Russia, as you pointed out. What would happen if Russia would launch and retaliate missiles into the territory of a NATO member? Then our treaty obligations would be triggered. Then we're talking about a full-scale war. I can't imagine that President Trump wants that. He's been totally against it. What I'm sure he wants is for Biden to stop screwing this up and allow him to get into office and begin to work towards America's security interests. Let's remember what our interests in the region are. It's our national security. That's what we ought to be putting first. And giving a green light to yeah, well, shoot missiles into Russia, that's not putting our interests first. Is. It's putting them last. And in domestic news, House Speaker Mike Johnson announced Wednesday that transgender-identifying individuals on the House side of the Capitol must use bathrooms in accordance with their biological sex, not their gender identity. In a statement, Johnson wrote, all single-sex facilities in the Capitol and House office buildings, such as restrooms, changing rooms, and locker rooms, are re reserved for individuals of that biological sex. It is important to note that each member office has its own private restroom, and unisex restrooms are available throughout the Capitol. Women deserve women's only spaces. Now, Johnson's comments come after Congresswoman Nancy Mace introduced a resolution banning transgender identifying men from women's restrooms in the House. Mace's resolution was in response to the election of Delaware Representative Sarah McBride, a biological man that identifies as a woman, to the House of Representatives this November. Yesterday, after conservatives criticized Johnson for failing to identify McBride as a biological man, Johnson defended himself. For anybody who doesn't know my well-established record on, on this issue, let me be unequivocally clear. Uh, a man is a man, and a woman is a woman, and a man cannot become a woman. That said, I also believe, um, that's what scripture teaches, what I just said, uh, but I also believe that we treat everybody with dignity. And so uh, we can do and believe all those things at the same time. And I wanted to make that clear for everybody because there's lots of questions. But that's where I stand. I've stood there my whole life, and those are facts. And in other domestic news, Colorado has agreed to pay over $1.5 million for violating an artist's First Amendment rights after she took her case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Last year, the court ruled that Lori Smith and her design studio, 303 Creative, could not be compelled by the state of Colorado to create art that violates her religious beliefs. Smith is a Christian and believes that marriage is between a man and a woman. Smith creates wedding websites, and Colorado's anti-discrimination law would have compelled her to create same-sex wedding websites. The United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of free speech. This is a victory not just for me, but for all of us. Whether your views on marriage are similar to mine or perhaps different, free speech is for everyone. And today's ruling affirmed that the government cannot force anyone to say something they don't believe. That was Lori after the Supreme Court's decision last year. And those are today's headlines. I'm Victoria Marshall. Up next is Washington Watch with Tony Perkins. We'll see you tomorrow with more news. From the heart of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., 
bringing compelling interviews, insightful analysis, taking you beyond the headlines and sound bites into conversations with our nation's leaders and newsmakers, all from a biblical worldview. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins starts now. As this council has previously called for, a durable end to the war must come with the release of the hostages. These two urgent goals are inextricably linked. This resolution abandoned that necessity, and for that reason, the United States could not support it. That was Ambassador Robert A. Wood, alternative representative of the U.S. at the United Nations, speaking earlier today after a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza failed. Welcome to Washington Watch, and thanks for tuning in. Later in the program, we'll hear from Carolyn Glick with her reaction to the United Nations' attempt to impose a ceasefire in Gaza without addressing the return of Israeli hostages. The outgoing Biden administration is raising the stakes in Ukraine. I can confirm, as you heard the Secretary of Defense speak to uh, earlier today, that we are providing the uh, Ukrainian government with non-persistent anti-personnel landmines. We have providing, been providing them with anti-tank landmines for some time, but this is the first time we are providing them with uh, anti-personnel landmines. That was State Department spokesman Matthew Miller earlier today. We'll be joined shortly by Alabama Senator Coach Tommy Tuberville. And is it really about the well-being of children or is it about the money? We are performing surgeries on these children that have neither the capacity to make these life-changing decisions nor the wisdom to know the difference. And we are telling them, this is your quick fix-all. And we are creating complications that require multiple surgeries. And the only people benefiting is the medical industrial complex because the more surgeries that are done, the more money is made. That was Dr. Melanie Kreitz Backert, who is featured in a new documentary, What is a Doctor? Later, Dr. Simone Gold, founder and president of America's Frontline Doctors, will join us to discuss this new documentary. And finally, despite losing by nearly 20,000 votes, despite the fact the AP and decision desk have called the race for Dave McCormick, Senator Casey is refusing to concede. That was Republican Senator Steve Daines, chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, earlier today discussing the Pennsylvania Senate race. Brent Kylan, vice president for strategic initiatives with FRC Action, will join us to provide the latest updates on election results across the United States. Stay tuned because we've got a packed program for you this evening. By the way, I invite you to join us for Operation Prayer Shield, which is a collective prayer effort in which we'll seek God's divine protection and guidance over our nation during this transition from one administration to the next. As you can tell from the stories we're covering each and every day, there's a lot at stake. The world is already volatile, and the decisions made in the next two months could make the situation even more intense. So join us. Text SHIELD, that's S H. I E L D to 67742. That's SHIELD to 67742. You'll receive weekly alerts, prayer points, and more. So text SHIELD to 67742. Over the past nearly four years, a hallmark of the Biden administration's foreign policy has been the avoidance of moves that they feel that they feared could lead to escalation of international conflict. But since the decisive victory of President-elect Donald Trump, that appears to have changed. Late yesterday, President Biden approved sending anti-personnel mines to Ukraine, reversing a previous policy. And this comes just days after the White House gave the green light for Ukraine to use U.S.-supplied longer-range missiles that will strike deep within Russia. What could be behind these moves and what could the effects be? Joining me now to discuss this and more is Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama. He serves on four Senate committees, including the Armed Services Committee. Coach, welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to see you. Hey, Tony, how are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. Uh, what do you make of the latest move by the Biden administration? Well, it's just trying to dig a deeper hole for, for uh, President Trump when he takes office, Tony. That's all they're trying to do. He's trying to put his legacy in. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing that this is going to do is going to get more people killed on both sides, more people injured. It's not going to prove anything. Listen, 
Number one, Ukraine can't win. They never could win this fight. It's just been a money laundering scheme from day one. Uh, obviously, we would love for Ukraine to be able to push back against uh, Russia, but that has not been possible. Now, we have spent $218 billion, Tony, on this war uh, to this point, and, and spending, by the way. Uh, our allies, NATO allies, and the world have only spent $52 billion. So the American taxpayers have funded almost all of this war. We've made no progress. They're losing more every day in, in Ukraine in terms of, of their land. And uh, Joe Biden just escalated it. And it scares me to death because, uh, you know, President Trump's going to come in. He's going to try to put some sense of reality in this, but they're making it worse and worse. And that's all by design. Do you think in these next two months during this window of transition that this could escalate beyond the borders of, of those two countries? Well, I think that uh, the, the guy that's got uh, more common sense than anybody is Vladimir Putin. Now, he is dead wrong of what he did of coming into another country, uh, but he said, uh, you know, I'm coming in, I'm protecting my Russian people. Uh, in Ukraine. But at the end of the day, this was not our fight. Uh, we should have gone in there. And even Vladimir Putin wanted, after two months, decided to call a peace treaty to this. But we called it off. Uh, they had a peace treaty done in um, Istanbul, Turkey, about two months after the war started. And we talked uh, Zelensky out of making peace. And so blood is on Joe Biden's hands. And he's going to go out with this all being on on, on his watch. And again, he's making it tough for President Trump to put put any kind of end to this, but President Trump will end this. Uh, I don't know how he's gonna do it, but he's the best negotiator in the world. We have zero negotiators in the Pentagon or the White House as we speak. What do you make of Vladimir Putin's announcement that they're lowering the threshold for the decision to use nuclear weapons? Do you, do you see yeah. that threat as real? No, not really. I, you know, what are you, what is he going to do? I mean, he, he said, listen, uh, I don't know whether you're going to, any of these missiles have uh, nuclear warheads on them. And so he's having to prepare his people for anything that happened. Uh, he's dealing with a, uh, a scared uh, leader, so-called leader in Zelensky in Ukraine. And he's dealing with a bunch of crazies in this Pentagon over here. That's all they're wanting to do is keep this fight going and prove that they were right all along, but they know that they're wrong. And uh, again, if Joe Biden wanted to do anything other than giving more missiles to shoot into Moscow and giving mines put on the ground to kill innocent people, he would load up his plane, leave at the Amazon where he's bird watching and fly to Moscow and say, OK, let's get this done. I'm almost history as United States uh, uh, president, but I want to get this done. Let's get it over with. Quit killing people. But there is no sense of reality, no common sense in this White House. Speaking of the Department of Defense, according to reports, the Department of Defense failed its seventh consecutive audit this past Friday because it was unable to fully account for its nearly $1 trillion budget, $824 million. Does something need to be done there? Oh, it's, something's going to be done. And, uh, you know, a new sheriff's getting ready to be in town. His name is Donald Trump, along with his deputies, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and and uh, Elon Musk, uh, they are fired up about coming in and start throwing stink bombs in all these buildings in Washington, D.C. saying, get out and let's do the accounting and let's find out where the taxpayers' money are going. We're tired of spending it. Tony, the bureaucracy up here is about 10 layers deep. They never fire anybody. Uh, by the way, then nobody works in the office down here anymore. All, you have all these beautiful buildings here for all these bureaucrats and all these agencies, and they all work from home. And uh, it's time to go back to work. It's time to work for the American people. And if you don't want to do it, uh, retire, do something else. But President Trump is going to get some sense of reality here. Tony, we, we don't have another chance. This will be the last time in your and my lifetime we'll have a chance to save this country. We only have two years uh, to do it. President Trump is going to hit the ground running. And we have to put everybody on notice that you got to be accountable for every dime. And if you get that money, you spend it the right way. You spend it on the American people, you protect the American people, and you do everything you possibly can to give us a chance and opportunity to lower taxes where people here can live a lot better life. So, so Coach Tuberville, you, you, you've been here long enough to know that things are not functioning. 
<laughs> what do you see as the top three changes you would like to see as Donald Trump comes in and you've got a Republican Senate and you've got a, a slim majority, but you've got a majority of Republicans in the House? What do you think is, number one, what needs to be done and what is possible, what's possible to get done? Yeah, first of all, we got to redo the tax form, uh, ta tax uh, bill that President Trump put into effect a few years ago. We got to make it permanent law. We got to drop taxes for the American people. Everything that the Biden administration has done is they regulated and taxed. This climate hoax that they've been pushing on everybody across the world, including the United States, is nothing but a tax. So we got to do the tax reform. We've got to close the border. We've got to build our military back. And we got to do something about education. We got to get God back in our schools, talk about families. We got two genders. We got to do everything possible to get back to common sense. But we got to teach these kids to read, to write, civics, history, science, the basic things. Because, Tony, as we speak, half the kids in this country can't read past the sixth grade reading level. And you got these teachers' unions that are sucking the American people dry on $27,000 per student a year that we spend, which is almost twice as much as any other country. And our kids are being cheated of an education. We're 29th in the world in education when we should be number one. Uh, President Trump has said in part it's the it's uh, disassembling the Department of Education. Do you see this as giving education back to the states? because? Honestly, the, the federal government doesn't provide that much. About 7 to 10 percent of the funding comes from the federal government. But they put a lot of strings on that 7 to 10 percent. Is this something the federal government needs to get out of? Yeah, the federal government basically holds uh, the states hostage. If you don't do this, if you don't do that, we're not going to send you your federal money. You're exactly right. Most of the money comes from the states. So. President Trump needs to come in. And again, this is the reason I ran for this job. And I, we, you and I have talked about this because I went into high schools and elementary schools and higher ed schools for the last 35 years before I got in this business. And I was shocked at what they were teaching, what was on the transcripts, the, the no education whatsoever in our urban areas or our rural areas are not bad. But the teachers unions have had a had a stranglehold on parents and, and, and the things that they're doing in these schools. So, uh, yes, President Trump will have a, a Secretary of Education, which is uh, uh, McMahon, I think. And I think that the, the first thing that we have to do there is we've got to streamline Washington, D.C. We've got about 3,000 employees. Why? Why do we need those? It's time for to cut our losses, have a small group up here in Washington, D.C., send the education back to the states, let them make decisions for their own communities, for their own state. Every state is different and do the things that we need to do to educate our kids. It's the number one thing that we have to do to change this country around because it's about family and education and God. And those three things, if we don't get those back, this country will not survive as the greatest country on the face of the earth. You're absolutely right. We've got to get on the other end of the pipeline and make sure these kids stop or stop, that the indoctrination stops. And the best way to do that is let the local communities do that. Get it away from Washington, D.C. Coach Tommy Tuberville, always great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Tony. God bless. All right. It is, folks, and that's something to pray about. We need to make sure that local communities get control and parents, parents need to control education. All right, coming up next, a new documentary is out that exposes a so-called gender-affirming care for what it really is. It's about making money. That's next. Download the new Stand Firm app for Apple and Android phones today and join a wonderful community of fellow believers. We've created a special place for you to access news from a biblical perspective, read and listen to daily devotionals, pray for current events, and more. Share the Stand Firm app with your friends, family, and church members, and stand firm everywhere you go. Let's not be discouraged. Don't lose heart. Don't lose the faith. Stand now strong because the Lord has given us the great privilege of living in a time when our choices matter, when our lives matter, when our courage matters. So let's stand together and save this great country. God bless the United States of America. The American Republic has a freedom like no other. It has roots in the scriptures far more than any other heritage. 
And if we as followers of Jesus and conservatives don't defend it, who will? Neutrality is not an option. There are many Christians who believe that if we just keep our heads down, if we just don't say the wrong thing, that, that somehow we will come out of this unscathed. You're naive if you think that, because what they want from us is not our silence. What they want from us is our submission. Part of the dilemma of Christianity in our generation is that we've relied a little too much on human wisdom and human reasoning, human strength, human resource, and we've relied too little on the power of God and God's ability to open doors that we can't open and do things that we couldn't even hope to begin to do. This may not be an easy task, but we are living in a moment of challenge, but also of great opportunity. And we know always that we are not alone, that His Spirit empowers us and protects us, and that He can do the unimaginable. Dobbs, after all, was never supposed to happen. Father, we thank you. You have entrusted us with this moment in history, and I pray that we would be found faithful, and that as a result of our faithfulness to you, that thousands, millions would come into the kingdom as they would experience the forgiveness of sin and the new life that is found only in Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you a Christian parent looking to raise a spiritual champion in today's culture? Renowned author George Barna has written a new book, Raising Spiritual Champions. This book offers valuable insights based on extensive research conducted by George Barna, the Family Research Council, and Arizona Christian University. Learn how to help your children discern biblical truth and find compelling meaning and purpose. Don't miss out on this essential resource for parents. Order your copy today. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Better yet, download the Stand Firm app. You can have us in your pocket anywhere you go. You'll have alerts, information, action steps to take to make sure you are informed and engaged as a citizen in the United States. Again, that's the Stand Firm app. All right, we've discussed at length on this program how people have been losing confidence in the media and the government. Well, many have also lost confidence in our medical institutions, especially after we saw doctors blindly pushing for the COVID jab on everyone during the pandemic, even supporting mandates on Americans, regardless of whether or not they were in vulnerable categories. And with so many kowtowing to transgenderism, many Americans are rightfully asking, what's a doctor? I mean, they're just like a politician in a white coat? Well. What is a doctor is the title of a new documentary that tackles this very question. And here now to discuss it, Dr. Simone Gold, who assembled some leading voices in medicine for this documentary. Dr. Gold is an experienced emergency physician and attorney, and is, she is also the founder and board chairman of American, America's Frontline Doctors. Dr. Gold, welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Delightful to be here. So let me ask you this, what inspired you to put together this documentary? We physicians were very upset during COVID to watch m really the healthcare in institutions and infrastructure just kind of collapse and not put patients first. It was shocking, astonishing, disheartening. And the good news about it is many independent minded physicians did find each other. And we have built a strong coalition, strong support group for each other to help patients. So we got to thinking, really, what is a doctor? Is a doctor a pill pusher? Is a doctor just a government employee? You know, there is a mouthpiece for the government. What is a doctor? We independent physicians know that a doctor has a higher calling, a special relationship to a, another human being sitting in front of them. And we put the doctor patient relationship first and we are standing for our patients who need us. That's yeah. what a doctor is. I want to get to the heart of the, the subject matter in this documentary on the transgender craze that uh, the medical community has been pushed into. But before I do, I want to ask you, what about these medical associations that, you know, you've got these little number, these letters behind your name as you're a part of this, you know, this nice association, but they've been so politicized. 
Yes, it's it's horrific. So in my, it, the good news is they are much less powerful than they used to be. In my father's day, the American Medical Association represented about two thirds of physicians. Now I think the number is about 15%. People don't know that they don't advertise it, but that's the truth. Many of us are choosing to leave these associations behind in the dust. They're terrible. An example of terrible is American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics. I would not go to a doctor that has those initials after their name. They've been corrupted. The evidence is overwhelming that they're not putting patients' best interest first. It's really a shame, but we have an opportunity to build back something better. It, and that's what you've been doing in, in terms of gathering these independent doctors who are willing to speak out. And of course, I often say in this program, courage breeds courage. So when someone steps forward, it's not long before others will step forward. This documentary takes on something that the American people, I think, are onto now. And that is this so-called gender-affirming care, which is nothing more than experimental drugs and surgical interventions and young people. Uh, most of them who couldn't even legally get a tattoo on their own are sometimes undergoing the, 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 the blade, have healthy body parts cut off. Talk about the documentary. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, there's a lot you could say about the gender dysphoria movement and the transgender activists who I call transgender groomers, quite frankly. But with this movie, we're sticking to the medical lane. What exactly is happening to these children? What are they being put through? What are their bodies being put through? We are doctors. We are not here to be butchers. We, we're not sorcerers. But we are Many of my peers are acting this way. They're cutting off healthy body parts. This is not the doctor's role. The doctor's role is to help take someone's body as healthy as it can be, not to make it destructive. And the words that are being used are very misleading. This is not affirming and it is not care. It is medical mutilation. You may remember 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it was all the rage that Americans were very concerned about female genital mutilation happening in African mm -hmm. nations. Right. We spoke out against it. This is that. This is that here in America, except it's to both it's to both sexes. But we are mutilating healthy young bodies, causing people to have lifelong infertility, and not the kind that you can fix with IVF, the kind where you produce no sperm or no egg forever, the kind where if you have a mastectomy at age 15, you will never be able to breastfeed, the kind of, um, the, it, it's horrific. So what we doctors did, we got together and we are pulling aside the curtain so the average American can see what's at stake. It's not nice words, it's chronic wounds, it's chronic infections, it's lifelong pills, lifelong medical care. We're exposing this mutilation industry for what it is. What is behind it? I mean, obviously it's not the interest of these children in terms of, I mean, as you just described, this, this is mutilating them and they're, and they're bound to take uh, these medicines and, and prescriptions for, for, the, for the rest of life. So what is behind it? What's driving this? I, I think there's two things. I think there's a social cultural movement, and this is including, uh, you know, towards the left and causing um, people of conscience really not to say anything for not fear of hurting people's feelings. And that's the social movement mm -hmm. and the gender uh, ideologues who have infiltrated the schools, who've infiltrated, um, you know, art clubs and where children associate and the medical organizations such as the Academy of Pediatrics. It's terrible. And the other part of it is each one of these children represents at least $1 million to the medical industrial complex over their lifetime. They have repeated surgeries. They've repeated medications for the rest of their lives. There's all kinds of surgeries and costs associated with this. So every case is lucrative. So it's both. Wow. There's gender ideologues and there's money. Wow. That, and we expose, it. We, we expose the institutions that are profiting in the film. So, okay. All right. How can folks watch this documentary? Please go to whatisadoctor.org. Whatisadoctor.org. We are streaming this for free. We do ask if you can make a donation afterwards, the same price you might do for a movie, but it's for free. It's critical, important. Whatisadoctor.org if you want to know more about this subject. Dr. Gold, what do you hope folks will take away from this documentary? Actually, you are empowered. The more you learn about this, the much more manageable it becomes. Some motivation for this is that families are being, uh, this issue has been dropped into families' laps all of a sudden. A 15-year-old girl comes home from school and all of a sudden announces to her parents that she's a boy. What does the family do? We have the answers for you what to do. Don't be bamboozled. Your common sense will get you through. You need a little bit of resources. That's what we're doing. We're doing it for the parents. We're doing it for people of faith and of conscience. And we're doing it also to wake up doctors so doctors start acting responsibly and ethically. 
and, and this empowers people to do just that. Dr. Gold, great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us and I appreciate the great work you're doing. Thank you so much. All right, folks, check it out. Uh, if you didn't catch that, you can go to TonyPerkins.com and you'll find uh, the link over. Uh, don't go away. We're back with more right after this. All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. Leah Sherabu, a Christian teenager in Nigeria, remains a captive of Boko Haram for her refusal to renounce her Christian faith. Chinese pastor Wang Yi is serving a nine-year sentence for speaking publicly against the Chinese government. In Pakistan, Asif Purvez is on death row for allegedly sending a blasphemous text message. All of this because people in power decided different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Welcome back. Uh, if you've not yet joined our Operation Prayer Shield, I invite you to do so as we pray for our country. Many of the issues we've just talked about today, and there are more, we're in a very vulnerable time. And I'm being very honest. We need the hand of God to protect our country and to protect Israel and our allies. So text the word SHIELD to 67742. That's 67742. All right, I know in this uh, advanced technology that we have uh, in our country, that it's frankly incredible that there are still races, elections to be called in several localities throughout the country. That's right. It's been two weeks since election day, and there are still races that they haven't decided the outcome. All right, so we're going to check in with uh, Brent Kylan. He's vice president for strategic initiatives at uh, FRC Action. He's going to give us the latest. Brent, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Tony. Good to be with you today. All right. So we know that uh, the GOP will be in control of the Senate next year, but there is an ongoing race in Pennsylvania that has not yet been called. Uh, well, it has been called, but it's uh, it's being uh, the, the results are being uh, challenged. Um, tell us where that race stands and what the outlook is for the Senate, and then give us uh, some of these uh, House races that are still outstanding. Absolutely, Tony. Starting with the Senate, like you said, we know that the Republicans will control the U.S. Senate next year. The big question is, will they have 52 seats or will they have 53 seats? And that's going to depend on this Pennsylvania U.S. Senate race. And, Tony, um, I'll get to the specifics of that in, in just a second. I think sometimes it's easy when you say, well, we already know the, the outcome of party control is one seat that important. The answer is it really really is. Um, if you look at a chamber the size of the U.S. Senate, it's a lot smaller than the U.S. House, and every vote really, really does make a difference. So even this one Pennsylvania U.S. Senate race, it, it's important. It's really important. So where do we stand? Well, like you said, they have uh, called it for uh, Republican Dave uh, McCormick. He was taking on incumbent Senator Bob Casey there. But the rule in Pennsylvania is that if the race uh, is decided by uh, half a point or less, there's an automatic 
uh, statewide recount. Well, this race is actually, uh, right now the margin is two-tenths of one point. So in other words, the, the current margin of victory is 16,000 votes out of about 6.9 million votes cast, which is just incredibly, incredibly thin. So they're, they're moving into that recount phase. Some counties started on Monday. Some uh, counties had until today to start that. So everybody is uh, is at least started with that. We should, Tony, know the results of this by next Tuesday. And I think those should be announced a week from uh, a week from today. So day before Thanksgiving, I will say, I think for Dave McCormick, he is in a very strong position. Um, it would be very, very uh, rare to see 16,000 ballots uh either overturned or a margin like that changed in a recount, but you definitely have to keep your eyes open uh, in, in a situation like this. So if the Republicans hold on to that seat, that gives them what? That gives them the 53, 53 seats going into next year. Which is, uh, you know, they the still, for cloture votes, they've got to have 60, but for a lot of procedural things, for it's 50 as they've changed some of the rules. So. Uh, that does give them a little bit of a cushion. It does. And, uh, Tony, other factor here is that there are a couple of very moderate Republicans. You, know, you talk about senators like um, Murkowski and, and Collins. If they don't want to, you know, go along with a conservative move, you do need a you de do need that cushion. So this is very important. So th this um, this basically disarms them from being able to hold the uh, the Republican majority hostage. If you have it, a third seat. It, it really does. It absolutely does. And that's why every single race like this is is just so important. Um, if you look at that race, we also have seen some news coming out of the court system in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania actual, uh, the state Supreme Court, they're actually just ruled on this. There were some local uh, Democrat-controlled election boards who had been trying to count hundreds of ballots that either were not dated or were not dated properly. The state Supreme Court just stepped in on Monday and, and really rebuked them pretty sharply and said, no, this absolutely is a violation of the law. So um, good to see things like that, but just another another reminder why we have to stay on top of these, uh, these types of situations, Tony. All right, um, Brent, what's the House look like? Absolutely. So right now, Decision Desk has called uh, 220 seats for the uh, Republicans, 213 uh, seats for the Democrats, and then there's two uncalled. Um, no surprise, those two uncalled races are in California. Uh, one of those is California 13, where the Republican is up by 227 votes. The other one is California 45, where the Democrat is up by 314 votes. So extremely thin margins. Tony, that being said, there's a couple races that have been called by a decision desk still worth keeping our eye on. Um, in Iowa, there's a congressional race where the Republican won, but by 800 votes, that's heading to a recount. Uh, in Ohio, there's a Democrat held seat. Democrats probably going to win uh, by 800 votes. That's also heading to a recount. And then the Alaska at large because of their, um, their ranked choice voting system there. We need to keep our eye on that as well. You know, Brent, when you look at those amounts of votes in a congressional district, 800, that's one or two churches. Uh, if, if they're voting and engaged can make the difference in the outcome of these elections. We, we were talking about that going into the election, how every vote matters. Uh, Brent, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Appreciate the update. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Every vote matters. That's why we need to be engaged, need to be informed and voting. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a look at uh, what's happening in Israel, also at the United Nations with a vote today attempting to force a ceasefire in Gaza, but that failed. That's coming up next. Don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of the Family Research Council here in Washington, D.C. Behind me is one of the most recognizable buildings in all the world, the U.S. Capitol. What does it stand for? Well, most people say government. But you know the Bible talks about four institutions of government? You know what they are? And do we have a republic or a democracy? Well, what do you say? Also, 
What about this thing, separation of church and state? Does that mean Christians shouldn't be involved in government? Guess what? We address those issues and more in our new God and Government course. I invite you to join us to see what the historical record and the Bible has to say about government. Join us for God and Government. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a Holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Welcome back. Again, let me invite you to join us for Operation Prayer Shield. Text SHIELD to 67742 and join us in praying for our nation during this time of transition, praying for our allies like Israel, vulnerable during this time. All right. Our word for today comes from Isaiah chapter 1. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. So where did God's people go wrong? Well, it was spiritual compromise, ideolo idolatry, and a, it was just a, a hollow form of religion. They were merely going through the motions. Moral corruption, creating gods in their own image, and it failed to inspire moral living. Political chaos or anarchy, when everyone does what's right in their own eyes, justice disappears. And when justice is absent, the weak and defenseless are the ones who suffer most. The decline cannot be reversed by political reform alone. Political efforts might slow it down, as could a reform of manners. But ultimately, the only remedy is to restore the foundation. And that requires a return to spiritual truth, a return to God. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, text BIBLE to 67742. Earlier today, the United States vetoed a UN security resolution uh, that would have called for a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war, noting that it did not call for the release of the hostages. Now, 14 of 15 council members voted yes to the resolution, but the U.S.'s sole no vote was enough to squash the resolution. In his comments following the vote, the alternate, the alternate representative of the U.S. in the U.N., Ambassador Robert Wood, noted that Hamas has been hoping that the international community would forget about the hostages. Does the 14 to 1 vote suggest that they may be succeeding? Joining me now to discuss this and other developments in the Middle East is Carolyn Glick. She is a senior contributing editor at the Jewish News Syndicate and host of the Carolyn Glick Show on JNS. Carolyn, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, it's great to be with you, Tony. It's really wonderful. Thank you. 
Well, welcome to the States. Uh, I know you're over here for a little bit. Uh, let me get your thoughts first on this latest resolution in today's vote. Well, first of all, I was very gratified to see that the Biden administration did, in fact, veto it. It was touch and go for a while, and that, that was disturbing. Uh, but uh, at least they came through in the end, and they vetoed this uh, deeply, deeply hostile resolution. We have two more that are in the pipeline uh, that are supposed to go forward in the next uh, few weeks. The first one is a bid in the U.N. General Assembly to oust Israel from the General Assembly that's been put forward by the Palestinians. And they have an automatic majority for that if they go through with the vote, as they have for every anti-Israel resolution that they put forward. And then there's another one that would uh, place, uh, uh, make it illegal and sanction Israel if we conduct any uh, construction activities, not only in Judea and Samaria, but in Jerusalem and in the Golan Heights. So that would be a very, very serious action by the Security Council if it goes forward. And so we're facing an all-out onslaught against Israel at the U.N., which just shows how deeply, deeply demented uh, that organization is, that they are siding with mass murderers against a democracy that's fighting for its survival and fighting these just forces of evil in the Middle East. Hey, Carolyn, I, I agree. It was good news to see the Biden administration take this veto, cast this veto vote in the U.N. today. But when I look at the Biden-Harris administration, it looks like the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde administration. When you look at um, some of the, the parting shots that they've taken at Israel, in fact, releasing another $230 million to go into Gaza, while at the same time putting sanctions on Israelis living in the uh, eastern part of, of Israel in Judea and Samaria. It's actually extremely shocking. I mean, we have to bear in mind that since October 7th, the uh, United States government under the Biden-Harris administration has poured $2 billion into the Palestinian coffers. And the Palestinian Authority, of course, funds terror, sponsors terror. They pay uh, salaries to terrorists who are in Israeli prisons and annuities to the families of terrorists who are dead. So that's one aspect of it. And it's just as a terrorist authority. And they're also pouring money into Gaza, which is still under the Hamas regime because the administration's policy is to block Israel's efforts to uh, be in charge of the distribution of humanitarian aid. And so by they're giving all of this uh, food and water, medicine, et cetera, to Hamas to distribute, and that maintains their iron grip on power. So it's acting under to undermine Israel's war goal of destroying Hamas as a military uh, organization and as a political entity. So, yeah, you're having this constant back and forth where they say one thing and then they do another, and it's very alarming. Yeah, thank you. I, I misstated that was not going, that $230 million was going to the Palestinian Authority, which oversees the uh, Judea and Samaria. But that's not gotten a lot of attention in the news. The the increase in terrorist activity that's been taking place, where you you have Jewish communities being attacked, you have suicide uh, vehicles and attacking uh, soldiers, that IDF soldiers that are in the area. So that's not getting much attention. But here we have unprecedented sanctions against Israeli citizens living in those areas. This is, I mean, usually that's designed to go after terrorists, criminals, people in, involved in, in violent activity. This is, appears to be nothing more than political disagreements. That's exactly right, and it's really alarming. Israel is the first U.S. ally that's ever been sanctioned by the U.S. We're the first democracy that's ever been sanctioned by the U.S., and there are currently more Israelis under U.S. sanctions than there are North Koreans. Those sanctions are supposed to be geared against terrorists, narco-terrorists, uh, you know, nar narcotics, kingpins, cartels. Um, and here they are. Um, it was uh, an organization or a company, a real estate company called Amana, that lawfully builds homes for Israelis inside of lawful Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria has just been placed under U.S. sanctions. They've sanctioned uh, uh, only people who are not indicted for anything. They've never been investigated for anything. They're not under arrest for anything. Under Israeli law, they've committed no crime. Under American law, they've committed no crime. They're being sanctioned because they 
uh, are viewed as danger to America's policy of establishing a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza and in Jerusalem. And this is a policy that's rejected by upwards of 85 percent of Israelis. So the Americans are going after Israelis whose sole uh, crime is uh, opposing America's uh, America, uh, the Biden administration's policies in relation to the Palestinians, which is just a stunning act of hostility against the people of Israel. But it's what we've been experiencing here in the United States with the weaponization of the federal government, that we've seen this, how they've gone after pro-lifers that have been outside praying of abortion clinics. And so it is the weaponization of government. The problem with this is it, it's unprecedented. It sets a new standard and, unfortunately, will be used again in, in the future. So this has to be, I think, uncategorically has to be repudiated and denounced as a misuse of authority and power. Now, these sanctions limit, I mean, they're, they're, they're more than just symbolic, because it does yes. restrict their ability to, uh, in some cases, have access to uh, international financial <coughs> institutions, uh, and in some cases is, is used to restrict travel. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these people are banned from the international banking system because Israel's banking system is attached to the U.S. Uh, uh, banking system to the SWIFT uh, system for international banking. So what they say to the Israeli banks is that you have to debank all of these people so they can't pay their mortgages, they can't pay for gas, they can't pay for their children's after-school activities, they can't pay for groceries, they don't have access to credit cards, they don't have access to their bank accounts. So uh, this is uh, causing you know people to foreclose on their mortgages, on their car payments uh, because they can't operate in a modern society where everything is digital and everything is ruled by credit cards and bank accounts. And so this is a this is a debilitating step that they're taking, again, against Israelis who haven't done anything wrong under American law or Israeli law. It's just that they take action that the Americans oppose. And it's not only people who are in Judea and Samaria either. I mean, there was this organization. It wasn't even an organization. This woman called for volunteers to come and block the aid convoys to Gaza because they were all going to resupply the enemies in times of war. It was a, And the Americans were forcing Israel to, and continue to force Israel to, allow the constant resupply of Hamas uh, in Gaza uh, under pain of an arms embargo. And that's something that is ongoing still today. So if we don't feed and clothe and water and, and provide medical uh, 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 medicines for Hamas, because they control all of this, then, we, then the Americans impose an embargo on, on, uh, on critical weapon supplies, which they're still doing today. Uh, to constrain our military actions. And so there, there, there was this outcry in the public, and people started just going at 3 o'clock in the morning to block the trucks from getting into Gaza. And so the Americans placed sanctions on this organization. Uh, it's called Sav9, and then on the woman who runs it, and she's married to an American citizen, so he's also under U.S. sanctions, and this is an American citizen with no due process, who has committed no crime, and his wife committed no crime, and yet they've been, they've been debanked. Their, their whole life is just a, you know in ruins because the administration decided that they don't like the fact that Israelis are trying to block the, 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 the transfer some, uh, of material aid to the enemy in times of war. I mean, it's free speech. I mean, we, we, we see what they were doing over here in this country, and they, didn't, they don't uh, touch uh, up, up those that are on the left doing similar demonstrations. Uh, uh, Carolyn, I want to get your reaction to, or get the reaction from Israelis to the, the election as they've had time to process and think through this. Um, how are they looking forward to a Trump administration? So, um, first of all, Israelis are exhilarated about the uh, results of the elections. I, I don't think that there's any question about that. You know, uh, the Israelis uh, overwhelmingly supported uh, Trump in all of the polling that we did uh, in the months preceding the election. Uh, Harris had essentially you know, about 12 percent support among the public, and uh, uh, Trump got around 70 percent of the support, and the rest didn't know. Um, so you're talking about uh, enormous support for President Trump and enthusiasm and excitement that he was reelected uh, among Israelis, as as you saw also unprecedented levels of American Jewish support at the polls in critical districts uh, throughout 
throughout the United States for President Trump. Um, so um, Israelis are exhilarated. We're worried about the next 60 days under Biden and where we're going to be by January 20th when Trump comes into office. But I think there's a sense overwhelmingly, or it's growing, <clears throat> that you know this was a miracle that uh, we got. Uh, four years with Trump, and we can't let one day go to waste. And really what we're being given here is not salvation. It's a chance for us to, uh, to, to secure our future, that, you know, the, the, the great aspect of the Trump pre presidency isn't even the amazing things that he did with recognizing Jerusalem is Israel's capital and moving the embassy, recognizing Israeli sovereignty in the, in the, in the Golan Heights, abrogating the nuclear deal with Iran, and so many other things that he did during his first term. It's also that he just stands by Israel and he says, look, you guys figure out what you need. Explain it to me, and if you convince me, then I'll support you because we're allies. And just standing on our side, this entire four years, there's been this gaslighting effect where Biden embraces us with this bear hug and says, oh, I'm for Israel, and I remember Golda Meir uh, in my first term as a senator, and, and yada, yada, yada. And on the other hand, uh, just implementing these incredibly hostile policies that protect Hamas, protect Iran, protect Hezbollah, protect the Houthis against Israel. And so it, it's just this sense that, wow, we're going to actually get an American administration coming into office, which is going to stand with us for real, not just by, not, not just lip service, but actually stand with us and not undercut us every time. So there's this profound sense of relief. And also, look, we have to just take advantage of this, because if we don't, uh, it'll be unforgivable. You know, Carolyn, many Christians in this country see the election the same way. It didn't save our country, but it sure gave us an opportunity to secure our future. But it requires a lot of activity from now uh, through the end of a four-year term. We've, we've got to take that responsibility uh, to, to rebuild it. And from our perspective, the moral foundation of our country, so because it's been disassembled by the left uh, very rapidly during the last four years. We just have a couple minutes left. I know you spoke generally, and it just, it's, it's nice to have a friend in the White House, a friendly administration, but are there any specific steps that Israel would like to see from the incoming administration? I think it'd be very important for the administration to say, look, we don't support a Palestinian state. Gaza was a Palestinian state for 18 years prior to their October 7th invasion. Uh, the, there can't be a Palestinian state. That that's just that's the, there is no two-state solution. There, this is a new path to the final solution to the Jewish problem, and we're not gonna we're not going with that. Israel obviously has to secure its future. It has to be the you know in charge militarily of Gaza. It has to apply its sovereignty to Judea and Samaria or whatever Israel wants to do on that count. But we no longer support a Palestinian state. I think that's very 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 important because otherwise, you know, we can find ourselves pushed back into this onto this merry-go-round of, of, of misery where we're constantly empowering terrorists. Another thing that's very important is to say, okay, what does it mean that Iran can't have nuclear weapons? It means that we support Israel in taking the action to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed state militarily. There is no diplomatic solution to this, only military. And we're going to stand with our ally, Israel, as it takes the kind of action it needs to take, so take Iran off the table as a nuclear state that undermines its hegemony and it also undermines the stability of its regime at home. Right. And, and, the la and, and the last thing is to say, look, you know, Israel does not have to sit with Hezbollah uh, at its doorstep, that it's obviously that the people on the north and northern border of Israel with, with Lebanon aren't going to be able to go home so long as that's the state of affairs. And, you know, Israel, you do what you need in order to secure northern Israel, and we're going to stand with you on that. I think those are very important things to do. And those three things would be game changers. Carolyn Glick, Excellent. always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on your program. It's always a joy to be with you. And folks, thank you for joining us as well. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com.